guys, welcome back to Lesson 79, John 11. You know, it feels like what we're going to talk about, we've already talked about. Because the reality is, we kind of have. We've talked about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We've talked about, you think about this, in Luke 7, the widow's son in Nain who got resurrected. We've talked about Jairus' daughter in Luke 8. We've talked about just a few of these resurrections. But all of those, they came alive right away. Like they died and then boom, they came back to life. What we're going to study today is a little bit more time. There's a little bit of a distance that took place from Lazarus's, yep, that's who we're going to talk about, his death, and then him, I'm already going to, spoiler alert, <laughs> he's coming back to life. We get to see uh, a good friend of Jesus, okay, the brother to Mary and Martha, we get to see him come back to life. And I think to me, it's one of the most incredible signs that God continues to show up time and time again. Now, in the first, literally the first 16 verses, you kind of have one theme of a character, and the character are the disciples. And so you're going to see verses 1 through 16. Uh, now, I should say this. This is kind of a, I'm, I'm giving you everything on the front end, and I'm doing this for a reason because I want you to, I want you to understand the bigger picture. Okay, the bigger picture is, and I love what uh, John MacArthur says, he says that what we're going to see here with the resurrection, okay, is it pointed to, remember, this is Christ doing the work, it pointed to his deity. Okay, so we want to show, Christ wants to show, uh, he's God, he can do these things. And then it also shows that this is kind of a good one, I think we all need this, is that it, what it did is, is it strengthened it strengthened the faith of disciples. You'll see their faith actually grow in this. But man, it's really encouraging because they definitely, they definitely don't always get it. <laughs> and then interesting enough, the resurrection of Lazarus, what it does lead directly, and you got to be patient with this in John 12, and it gets there in tw verse 23, it'll eventually lead, okay, what they did, it led directly because of what he did here, to the cross. Why? Because the religious, some of the religious don't believe in the resurrection. So the more that he keeps hitting on these hot buttons, and I think we've established this now enough, right, that there's definitely a tension between the religion and the relationship side. Christ wants people to have a relationship with him. They want a religion that goes and flows just like a machine. And so when you begin to walk through this resurrection of Lazarus, that's why they don't like Lazarus down the road because his testimony radically goes in the face of a spirit of religion. So it says in verse 1 of John 11, we begin to unpack 16 verses about the disciples. Now a man was sick. Lazarus was from Bethany, the village of Mary and uh, her sister Martha. Martha, just so you know, Bethany was about um, on the east side of the Mount of Olives, uh, and it was along the road as they're actually going to Jericho. Now in verse 2 it says, Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair. And it was her brother Lazarus who was sick. Like this, let's just call it out, this is a well-known family. And so it was her brother Lazarus who was sick. Now it says in verse 3, and I always laugh when I see this phrase, the sisters. It just seems old school, you know, when you call them my sisters. So Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, they sent a message to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. At this point, has he died? No. So the messenger is on the way saying, hey, can you come? My, our brother is, is sick. And obviously they know him, Jesus, well enough. They, sit, they know where he is. They could find him and they could send a message. It says then in verse 4, when Jesus heard it, he said this, this sickness will not end in death, but for the glory of God. Okay, so there it is. It points to his de 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 deity. It's the glory of the Lord of why he does this. So that the Son of God, remember our phrase for the Gospel of John. So why does this John 11 take place? So that the Son of God may be glorified through it. What happened in John 10? So the Son of God may be glorified through it. And then interesting enough, so that verse, just so you know, in John 11 verse 4, is super key verse in this whole chapter. And if not, all of the book. For the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And in verse 5, now Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. Why on earth do you put this passage right here? Why? Just to show the relationship that Christ had with them, that it was not, he's not being flippant in verse 4. Good. He's got a relationship with them. I think he's showing he's compassionate. Absolutely. He, 
he's not blowing them off because he doesn't care. He's not the, the, the false shepherd, right? That's eating spiritually fat things and just staying in his own place and guzzling beer. I mean, seriously, because that's what we just talked about. The good shepherd would lay down his life. The good shepherd will go after. And for some reason he says, no, not, not yet. And so I just want to make sure we're not confusing John 10 and 11 saying, well, Jesus is a hypocrite. He's not at all. He's setting the stage for what's to come. In verse six, it says, so when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. <laughs> so it's all about, it's all about, and we're going to get into this a little bit more here about God's timing. But I do want to explain this process of the four days. Okay. Day one, what happens? The messengers, right? They come to Jesus. And at that time, right, uh, right now has, has Lazarus died? that we know of, right? We don't know. We just know and said Lazarus is sick. That's all we know, okay? Now on day two, okay, what happens? The messenger, he has to return to Bethany. Returns to Bethany. Okay, now on day three, what does it say? It says Jesus, it says he waits, doesn't he? And then it says in day four, Jesus arrives, Jesus leaves. Just kind of keep that in the back of your mind about the timing, okay? We'll get into a little bit more of those details, but just, just the process. So it says in verse 7, after that, after he had stayed two days, right? Because the messenger returns to Bethany and then he waits, right? And then on day four, he then shows up, right? Fair enough. And he says to his disciples, hey, let's, let's go to Judea again. Well, you guys, that's like going into a death trap. I mean, where did he just come from? He just came from in John 10, John 9, eventually, since basically since John 7, nobody's liked him. Everywhere he goes, he's stirring the pot. I shouldn't say nobody. The religious don't like him. And so it says in verse 8, Rabbi, the disciples told him, just now the Jews tried to stone you and you're going there again? Like, what, what do you mean you want me to go back? We, you want us to go back? I mean, think about this. Kevin, can you go to John 8, verse uh, 59? John 8, verse 59 says, And at that they picked up stones to throw at Jesus. But remember, Jesus was hidden and went out of the temple complex. So what did they want to do? This was after Jesus was saying he was before Abraham. And then they wanted to throw stones at him. Now go to John 10, verse 31. This is what the disciples are referencing. In John 10, verse 31, it says this. It says, Again, the Jew Jews picked up rocks to stone him. I mean, you guys, over and over again, they want to constantly, like, because he's pushing the envelope of the religious, they're wanting to kill him. And oh, by the way, let, let's, let's go back. <laughs> and in verse 9, Jesus says this, aren't there 12 hours in a day? Jesus answered, if anybody walks during the day, he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of this world. And if anybody walks during the, the night, he does stumble because the light is not in him. In other words, it's all about God's timing. Think about this. Can you go to John 2, verse 4? I mean, Jesus clearly is, is living, as Warren Wiersbe says, on a divine time frame. He knows this. He says, what is this concern of yours to do with me, woman? My hour has not yet come. John 7, verse 6. You're going to begin to see him saying the same thing. John 7, John 7 verse 6. My time has not yet arrived, but your time is always at hand. Verse 8 says, go up to the festival yourselves. I'm not going up to the festival yet. Memory sends the disciples because my time has not yet fully come. So what he's constantly doing is he, he knows when is the time. I, I, we could literally keep doing this. Just go to John 8, verse 20. And I think this is really important because he's all knowing. He knows his time. He knows this. He understands this. He spoke these words by the, by the treasury while teaching in the temple complex. But no one seized him because his hour had not come. So over and over and over, go to John 17, verse 1. Let's go to the extreme now. John 17, verse 1. Obviously, this is after John 11. Jesus spoke these things. He looked up to heaven and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that the son may glorify you. So he knows when is his time and when is not his time. He knows he still has time to walk in the light. Now, Maybe this is a stretch and I didn't see anybody else really go there, but I just kind of felt as I was praying through this. Can, can you go to Matthew 26, verse 47? I want to kind of go, how did we get to John 17? Real quick, okay? I'm going to unpack a little bit. Maybe you wouldn't think we're going to go here. 
Now think about this, okay? At nighttime, okay, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, suddenly arrived. A large mob with swords and clubs was with him from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Verse 48. His betrayer had given them a sign, the one I kiss, he's the one, arrest him. And then it goes to verse 49. So he went right up to Jesus and said, greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. So at night, okay, the time was done. At night, Jesus then turned himself over, right? Is this true? Turned himself over. Now, as this continues to go on, go to uh, Matthew 26, verse 57. In the nighttime, okay, those who had arrested Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had convened. So now we're going to start seeing the arrest. Now we're going to begin to see Jesus at night. We're not in the light anymore. We're not in the daytime. He's begun to turn himself over. Jesus knows when is the time to walk it out in the day and when it's going to happen at night. I think this is just an interesting thing. Now, how do you know all of this took place at night? If you go to Mark, uh, Matthew 26, verse 74 and 75. Matthew 26, verse 74 and 75, uh, it says this. Then he started to curse and to swear with an oath, I do not know the man. Remember, Peter denies Jesus three times and then a rooster crowed. Um, I think this is just really, I don't know, this just kind of put some stuff together for me. Matthew 27, verse 1, it says this. When daybreak came, all of the chief priests and the elders of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. All of these things happened Sunrise, rooster crows, daybreak, daybreak comes, chief priest. And then the reality is now when I go back to verse 9 and 10, if anybody walk during, walks during the night, he does stumble because the light is not in him. I'm not saying that Christ didn't have the light. I'm just emphasizing that this moment his time is done. And so here's what he says in verse 11 of John, uh, John 11. John 11, 11. He said this, and then he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm on my way to wake him up. Well, just... Send an alarm clock, right? I mean, that's kind of the mentality. Then the disciples, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will get well. Jesus, however, was speaking about his death. But they thought he was actually speaking about natural sleep. And so here's why I'm going to this, this thing, is that the disciples were clueless, clueless that he was talking about actual death. Why, why, why would we need to go back to Judea if he's sleeping? I know he's a hard sleeper, but it will be fine, right? I mean, that's kind of the mentality. But you have to understand something. As the New Testament unfolds, death eventually is becoming compared to sleep. Now think about this in Acts 7, verse 60. It's a cool comparison here. In Acts 7, verse 60, Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with the sin. Uh, and, the, and saying this, he fell asleep. Okay, so there you go. You know, this is Stephen, right? And this is Stephen, and he... He died. But yet in the scripture, it says, ah, he just fell asleep. Like this could be confusing if you're like, what? What is he talking about? Go to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. Now this is the Apostle Paul talking here. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. Listen, I'm telling you a mystery. We will not all fall asleep, but we will all be changed. In fact, some people might fall asleep, but some people might still be alive when the return of Christ comes back. So there's that death and asleep mentality. One more. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. I just want to make sure you understand this is a common theme in the New Testament. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, concerning those who are asleep. You know what that means? It's those who have passed away, those who are dead, so that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope. It goes on to verse 18. You know what it says all the way? It goes all the way through, and it says those who have fallen asleep, we're going to have life. They're going to come back up. It says they're going to be meeting up in the air with those that are still alive. So we will, whether you're asleep or quote unquote dead, you will still be with the Lord. So there's this language of when Jesus says in John 11, ah, he's just asleep. Well, that could be confusing to these guys. Well, I don't understand. What are, you, what are you talking about? So then Jesus says in verse 14, he makes it plain. This is the Betty Knapp from Flint, Michigan. When you're preaching and she just shouts out, hey, make it plain. This is Jesus making it plain. He said, Lazarus has died. In verse uh, 15, it says, I'm glad for you that I wasn't there. He's talking to his disciples. So that I, wa I, that I wasn't there so that you may believe. I want you to increase in believing. I want you to understand this, but let's go to him. And so then in verse 16, it says, And Thomas called the twin, which means he probably had a twin brother, said to his fellow disciples, Let's go so that we may die with him. He's like, Yeah, let's do this. Like, well, they just were saying, We don't, we don't need to go. He's just sleeping. And now all of a sudden, Thomas is like, yeah, let's do this. 
And what I love about what Wearsby says is he goes, you know, the reality is we don't know Thomas's twin, but I think we probably are his twin. All of us. And here's why. Because sometimes he demands the truth of Christ saying, oh, prove it to me. And then the next minute he's like, oh, I'll die with you. It's like this emotional roller coaster. And the reality is that a lot of us, we're probably just like Thomas. Jesus, can you, can you prove it to me about, did you really die? Is that really you? Or you're so on the flip side, I'm in, man. I'm all in. I've sold everything and I'm in. And I, I think this is Thomas. And the disciples, through the first 16 verses, everything is fluctuating. And they're just trying to figure out how to follow Christ. So then when it gets to verse 17, we got some new characters that come into the, into the play. In uh, 17 through 40, you know who we have? The sisters. So we went through the disciples walking with Jesus, now to the sisters. And it says in verse 17, when Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for how long? Oh my, four days. Okay, so here's what you have, right? Bethany, right, was near Jerusalem. This is a town about two miles away. And many of the Jews, it says in verse 19, had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them about their brother. All right, let's just, quick summary, Luke 10, remember this. Martha, she was the which one, Kevin? Uh, the worker. Yeah, she's the worker. She's the busy one. Mary was the what one? Uh, sit at Jesus' feet. Yeah, she sat at Jesus' feet. She washed his feet. She was like the one with Jesus. Martha was the one like working towards Jesus. Like that's just kind of the, the mentality, right, that they constantly have. And so it says, many of the Jews had come to Martha and to Mary to comfort them about their brother. As soon as Martha heard that Jesus was coming, what did Martha do? She goes, she's busy. I'm going to go find Jesus. She went to meet him. But Mary, she remained seated in the house. Then the classic line in verse 21. You know what the sisters say? Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. So we know, remember back in verse 17, the transition had been gone from he's sick to now he's dead. And Martha comes running out to Jesus and you wonder what her tone was like. You wonder if she's finger pointing. She's wondering like, dude, I know how long it takes to get here. Where you been? Like, I love my brother. What are you doing? I mean, you would think there's probably some of that. And then yet, this is what she says in verse 22. Yet even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. She recognizes and she realizes that Jesus has this ridiculous fun connection with God the Father. And so she doesn't want to say anything too stupid to completely ruin her chances. Right? Don't you think? I mean, I think there's some of that. And in verse 23, Jesus responds to Martha and she said, he says, your brother will rise again. I want to say something about those that have lost somebody. Uh, those that are grieving. Um, one, it's healthy to grieve. Two, what I see here with Martha, she expresses all of her emotions to Jesus. She doesn't hold back. If you would have been here, I don't understand. But then she realizes, but I know you're still in control. So I just want to, I want to release you guys to, it's okay to talk to the Lord. It's okay to vent to the Lord. He wants you to talk to him, but recognize as you vent, he's still in control. I just want you to understand, give everything to him, but still realize he knows what he's doing. We might not understand it. We might not unfold the timing like we want, but it's okay to come to him with every ounce of emotion. And in verse 23, Jesus responds to the emotion. He says, your brother will rise again, Jesus told her. And Martha said, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. She clearly thinks he's talking about the resurrection that Daniel's talking about. And Daniel 12, verse 2, Kevin, can you go there? She thinks, oh yeah, I know, I know, I know, I get this, Jesus. In Daniel 12, verse 2, it says this, Many of those asleep who sleep in the dust of the earth, what will happen? Will awake, some to eternal life and some to shame and eternal content. Verse 3, those are, who are wise will shine like the bright expanse of the heavens and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. She understands in verse 2, back in verse 2, that yes, he could still come back to life. Okay, I get it. And what I love this is in verse 25, here it is, guys, our fifth I am. So we have had this so far. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. And then number five, he says, I am. He says, I am the resurrection and life. There's seven of them and this is number five. 
the one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Now, I think, based on what we've determined, you guys, these little butterflies represent the resurrection and life. Would you guys agree? The egg does, too. And the egg does. Thank you. That's absolutely. So they, they, the butterfly is coming from the egg. Good picture. Thanks. So I just love this image about I am the resurrection and life. You're resurrected. You ready from this? From death. You're resurrected uh, into new life. And Jesus says, no, no, no. I'm not talking about that. I'm saying it's, it's me. I am. I'm not talking about the future right now. I'm talking about the present. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die, ever. Do you believe? And in verse 27, it's a key verse. She says, yes, Lord. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. What an awesome, what an awesome word. This is the exact reason why he probably wrote John 20, verse 30. I believe you're the Messiah. Remember, this is one of the I am's. So what's the purpose of John 20, verse 30 and 31? What's the purpose of this book? He says he performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. Why? Because in verse 31, but these are written so that you may believe exactly what Martha just said. Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And by believing, you may have life in his name. Martha then gives the words for John to write this thing down. How cool is this? I believe you are the Messiah. And this is right after he just said, I am the resurrection and life. And then in verse 28, it says, after having said this, she went back and called her sister Mary. Hey, Mary. So this isn't a big deal. The teacher is here and he's, and he's calling for you. And as soon as she, she heard this, Mary then got up quickly and went to him. So you have to wonder, did Mary not go the first time because she didn't know? Martha obviously heard. It appears, it appears that Mary didn't hear the thought. As soon as she heard this, Mary got up quickly, went to Jesus. Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. So he's just still hanging out. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw that Mary got up quickly and went out. So they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to cry there. When Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet. There's Mary again, constantly falling at his feet. Strangely enough, though, this still hasn't happened yet, right? So she still hasn't walked through this process. And she told him, Lord, if you had died, if you had, I'm sorry, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. It's the same line, you guys. It's the same text as what Mary said. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. It's like they're saying the, they're saying the same thing. I'm guessing in the four days, they probably had that conversation somewhere. Somewhere they had this dialogue. It's a sister setup, right? <laughs> and in verse 33, when Jesus saw her crying and the Jews who had come with her crying. Now, remember, we've talked about this, you guys. Whenever there is a death, whenever there is a funeral, the oral tradition says, even if you're dirt poor, you still had to hire at least two flute players, right? And then you had to have at least one professional wailing woman to, to mourn the dead. Okay, so there's a really good chance, and we've talked about this, that as, as Mary and Martha are running, the flute players are coming, the mourners are coming, the wailers are coming, and I think it's probably fair to say they're probably a, a prominent family. So they're probably not just the poor family, they probably had multiple people. So they see, Jesus sees all of this. And it says he was angry. Uh, uh, John MacArthur said that that word could mean he groaned. And why was he angry in his spirit and deeply moved? I always took it as like, well, because Mary and Martha are sad. Like she's crying, but there's anger here and he's mad because of the unbelief. He's angry at whether it's the Jews or them. He's just, he's angry about their unbelief. In verse 34, he says, where have you put him? Lord, they told him, come and see. And in verse 35, Jesus wept. Now this terminology, Jesus wept, is this Greek word that talks about this, uh, there's this commotion of silently just busting out into tears. Like it's just like this radical, it just, it comes. And it paints this incredible picture of John 3, 16 about Jesus being a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Like this is Jesus. He's a man of sorrows and he's acquainted with grief. And so it says in verse 36, so the Jews said, uh, see how he loved him. Like they thought, yes, it's because of this compassion. But some of them said, couldn't he open the eyes? Uh, couldn't, he, 
Couldn't he who opened the blind man's eyes also have kept this man from, from dying? Then Jesus, this is crazy, angry in himself again, he came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. And this is what he says. Remember, four days, a body has been decaying, decomposed. It's been four days. And he says, remove the stone. He says, didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Four days, that body is there. And in verse 41, you have one little group left. One little group left, the Jews. And it really goes to verse 57, which we're not going to cover. So they removed the stone. Jesus raised his eyes and he said this for everybody to hear. Father, I thank you that you heard me. I know that you always hear me. Because of the, but because of the crowd standing here, I said this, I said this, so they may believe you sent me. So he's saying these things out loud. Why? Because of the works. Remember in John 4, remember the, uh, in John 5, the works that the Father has sent Christ to do? I'm doing these things so people would believe. They, they see the signs that they would believe and they begin to realize that the works are testifying about Christ. Like everything begins to tie together. And in verse 43, he just says, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. It's an awesome picture. I want to go back to John 10. My sheep hear my voice and my sheep follow. In verse 44, the dead man came out bound hand and foot with linen strips and with his face wrapped in cloth. And Jesus said to him, loose him and let him go. Man, crazy enough in verse 45, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he did, it says at that moment, believed in him. Here's how I want to close all this. Jesus clearly says, I am the resurrection and life. I'm the only one that can take you from death to life. Whether it's here temporarily or whether it's eternally, Jesus says, I am it. I'm the only one that can give life. And so here's the challenge, you guys. Regardless of where you're at in life, regardless if you're grieving or if you're finding joy, trust the, the heart of God and that He wants what's best for you. So trust in his timing. Trust in that he's working always for you. He's always working for you. In Romans 8, 28, he says everything's going to come together for those that love him. But I want you to understand something. When the circumstances still don't make sense, please do this. Trust that God's timing is bigger than ours. Jesus clearly knew over the course of four days he didn't need to go yet. And I think sometimes we try to force the hand of Christ. We try to force the hand of God so that we can get what we want. But pull back for a second. And all I want to just say is in Jeremiah 17, verse 7. Jeremiah 17, verse 7, it says this. The man who trusts in the Lord, whose, confident is, whose confidence indeed is the Lord, is blessed. Now watch in verse 8. He'll be like a tree planted like water, planted by water. It, it sends its roots out towards stream. It doesn't fear when heat comes and its foliage remains grain. It will not worry in a year of drought or cease producing fruit. Regardless of the situation that you are in right now, all I can say is trust in the Lord's timing. All right, guys, that's John 11, Lesson 79. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Thanks. Thanks.